This is Duke University. The theme of this year's symposium is Understanding Neural Circuits, Development, Plasticity, and Function. And I cannot think of a more timely and relevant topic in a year when our brains have had to adapt and be resilient in the face of changes in our environments that we couldn't have imagined and we certainly have never encountered before. And I'm hoping that all the insights that we learn about today will um, give us hope that our brains will adapt and be resilient through this experience. So without further ado, because I know you're all eager to hear uh, three of our brilliant uh, faculty members, as well as our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Eve Martyr, I am going to introduce our provost, Sally Kornbluth, and she will welcome you to the event. Dr. Thanks very much, Jerry. Uh, so uh, good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to the 2021 Duke Institute for Brain Sciences Annual Distinguished Lecture and Symposium. Um, I really want to thank everyone at the Institute for their efforts in organizing today's events. Uh, Jerry just thanked others, but I really want to thank Jerry, a director of DIBS, also all of the members of the faculty steering committee, uh, Colleen Bauer for managing the logistics of the event. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the poster session, learning about the exciting work of the students and trainees. And I'll add my congratulation to this year's poster awardees for clinical and basic science. Um, you know, so I've actually tried to attend these events in the past in and out, and I have to apologize today because I actually jumped out of an appointment promotion and tenure meeting, which is maybe one good thing about Zoom. You can actually beam between events, but I did want to take the opportunity to, to really just say how fantastic I think these events are. And as Jerry said, the theme is understanding neural circuits, development, plasticity, and function. And obviously the technological advances have allowed us to observe, manipulate, and understand how neural circuits develop and function. And most importantly, how they change over time and respond to the environment. As Jerry also said, you'll hear from three Duke faculty members today, Nicole Kalakis, uh, Palin Vulcan, and Michael Tadros, who'll be sharing their work on this topic and illustrate how advances in understanding neural circuitry are opening up new ways of treating disorders of the brain. Um, their presentations will be followed by our keynote speaker, Dr. Eve Martyr, whose work has been fundamental in understanding how neural circuits develop and what allows them to be so remarkably plastic and adaptable. You know, I have to say, uh, we are in the middle of um, our sort of launch of the Duke Science and Technology Initiative. And one of the themes is resilience uh, body and brain. And I think nothing could illustrate that better uh, than the symposium today. So whether that was by chance or plan, it aligns extremely well uh, with what we're, what we're trying to build going forward uh, in the sciences, both uh, on the medical school side and on the campus. So I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful dovetailing with the emphases we're making in science going forward. So again, welcome everyone to the symposium. Um, I'm sure these are going to be wonderful talks and, you know, thanks for attending the event. And I'm going to turn it over now to Allison Adcock, who will be moderating the, moderating the next uh, portion of this event. So thanks very much. I am I'm the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and one of the associate directors of DIBS. And I have the privilege of introducing our three faculty speakers, uh, Nicole Kalakos, um, Palin Vulcan and Michael Tadros. We have them lined up and please enter questions for them in the Q&A feature and we will bring them back out um, during the moderated panel at the end. So to start, um, Nicole Kalakos will start us off with her talk, Spotlight Reveals Hidden Mechanisms of Neuromodulation for Protein Synthesis Pathway Involved in Regulating Synaptic Plasticity, Learning and Memory. Nicole um, is the Lincoln Financial Group Professor of Neurobiology and Chief of the Movement Disorders section in neurology at Duke University Medical Center. Her laboratory studies how synaptic plasticity generates learning and adaptive behavior and how disruptions cause diseases of basal ganglia circuitry. Her lab is recognized for its contributions to understanding formation, compulsive behavior, and dystonias, and for the generation of new methods for studying basal ganglia physiology. Dr. Clock has received her bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley and her MD and PhD degrees from Stanford and did residency at neurology um, in neurology at the UC uh, San Francisco. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this event. 
for myself and probably many others, I find it really awe-inspiring to consider the capacity of the brain as a learning machine. In many ways, the process of learning is analogous to getting a software update to the hard drive that is the brain. But yet, it also seems as though this process isn't so simple or uniform. For example, why does one person excel, as in our elite basketball players, while others struggle to learn from even basic experiences? And why does this capacity change over the course of our lives? Understanding the brain's plasticity mechanisms is what fascinates my lab, and it's also critical to help us find treatments for many significant brain diseases. Our lab works to understand plasticity mechanisms from its basic cellular processes to the impact that these cellular changes have on synaptic function and circuits to change behavior. A major mechanism for the brain to affect long-lasting functional differences as a result of experience is by changing the strength or efficiency of synaptic communication between cells. Synapses, as a result of experience, can get both stronger and weaker in processes we may refer to as LTP and LTD. Today's talk will focus on one step along the path from experience to plasticity, and that is the role of protein synthesis. Synthesizing new proteins at the synapse is a fundamental part of the transition from experience to memory. And in the long, large, complex structure of neurons, this is often regulated locally at synaptic outposts. Many proteins that regulate protein synthesis are found in the synapse and associated with brain diseases, as in the example shown here for many autism-related genes. For reasons I don't have time to introduce, we wanted to understand how this particular protein synthesis pathway influences synaptic plasticity, learning, and memory. The integrated stress response, or ISR, is a highly conserved pathway that in all cells can be activated by a cellular stress, like unfolded proteins, viral infection, or nutritional deficiency. It's activated by phosphorylating EIF2-alpha, and this is part of the EIF2 complex that's absolutely required for initiation of protein synthesis by loading the first methionine onto the start codon. When it's phosphorylated, its activity kinetics and complex assembly are affected in ways that dramatically alter protein synthesis. Many, many proteins stop being made, but another subset are now increasingly made. So a simple way to think of this pathway is that it's a phospho switch for which proteins are being made in a cell. In the brain, this pathway is also proven to matter for a significant number of brain disorders. And an overarching theme that is, has emerged is, if that, is that if you inhibit the ISR, you can enhance learning and memory, at least in mouse models. But pharma is now also developing ISR inhibitors for their potential and testing in clinical trials. So let me introduce a quick summary of the working model we have for the ISR in the brain. And this was founded on a, a good foundation in, in, a, in a cell paper in 2007 by Mauro Costamattioli. And it's basically that upon activation, you will trigger cascade of events that lead to long-term synaptic depression. And this kind of model is reminiscent of other familiar models we have, such as MGLUR-LTD and the role of the fragile X protein in synthesizing what are called LTD-specifying mRNAs. Along with these, um, when you inhibit this, you can bias towards finding long-term potentiation and behaviorally faster learning. As one example here in this Morris water maze, where mice with an impaired ISR pathway learn more quickly over time 
to find the hidden platform than their wild type siblings. So is the ISR acting at the synapse? We have this observation to suggest that idea. ISR activation was higher in the synaptic puncta with lower amounts of surface glutamate receptors. All these observations led us to want to know whether this pathway could be involved in a form of basal ganglia LTD that we were interested in. And we found that yes, it is. Here we're measuring synaptic strength over time. And if we induce LTD in the presence of an inhibitor of the ISR, ISRIB, we block LTD. So now we started dreaming. Could it be possible to harness the ISR activation in order to capture plasticity ensembles? We are familiar with activity-based traps based on immediate early gene expression like CFOS and ARC, but what if we could capture plasticity-specific ensembles, those cell populations in this example undergoing LTD? I'll be talking about that today, but even more in the future, stay tuned for what if we could get this to the single synapse level. So I told you that different proteins were synthesized based on ISR activation state. So we thought maybe we could color code these two translational states. And to do this, Zach further made the clever realization that we could use a mechanism that the ISR had been discovered to use involving competition by open, by upstream open reading frames and have both reporter readouts on the same mRNA. And so when the path ISR is activated, we'll get synthesis of TD tomato. And when it's not phosphorylated, you'll get GFP. So we pack in one of uh, the nice Grodnaro capsids that we could express and survey cells throughout the brain after a simple injection to the eye. And for the most part, as you would think from the working model of a process involved in cell stress and plasticity, in the normal brain, it was mostly green, indicating the ISR is off. So Ashley then did a series of known ISR manipulations to further validate whether the green and red cells signals were behaving as predicted, and they were. Here in this experiment, we're activating the ISR with tunicomycin, and we can see both the red reporter coming online as well as immunostaining for EIF2-alpha phosphorylation. And this is just a summary of a number of experiments, again, showing the correlation between the indicator of ISR activation and the spotlight red signal. So now taking a closer look at the brain, for the most part, again, we saw that most cells don't have the ISR activated, but a rare cell here and there does. Maybe the cell's having a bad day, its cell stresses activated, or maybe it experienced LTD. So now we're ready to go and use Spotlight to capture our plasticity ensembles um, through a variety of manipulations, just, just taking them through experience and learning. So what did we find? Well, that perhaps this wasn't so easy or maybe things weren't working as we had preconceived. Around this time, Spotlight also showed us something wholly unexpected from working models for the ISR, in which you normally think of the pathway as off, and then it's transiently turned on by specific conditions like those evoking cell stress or synaptic plasticity. In striatal cholinergic interneurons, we made the surprising finding that instead of a cell here and there that had the ISR activated, all of these cells normally seem to activate the ISR. They were all red. And yes, using immunostain against ISR markers, we could confirm that Spotlight accurately reflected that the ISR was constitutively on in cholinergic neurons.
So what is the ISR doing in striatal cholinergic interneurons? Well, we had one clue. We, know, we knew that although in synaptic plasticity, there's a lot of focus on the cell autonomous activities that lead to synaptic strengthening and weakening, especially local synaptic events. However, there are other cells, yes, neuromodulators, that also have a role in facilitating these events. In fact, I guess now that I'm saying it this way, maybe these are like mentors making the path to a desired outcome more or less likely, but not capable of doing the actual hard work to get there. In our striatal circuit, this other cell happens to be the cholinergic neuron. For LTD on medium spiny neurons to happen, dopamine needs to signal to cholinergic interneurons and cause them to slow down their tonic pacemaking activity. So we wondered, could ISRIB have blocked our LTD on medium spiny neurons by interfering with the cholinergic interneurons role? We can measure this as follows by doing a cell attached recording in acute brain slice and applying a D2R agonist and watching the tonic firing slow down in the presence of the D2R drug. We'll be presenting these results as a log two so that when it slows, the uh, ratio is below the x-axis and when it increases, it's above. And here, the short answer is yes, the ISR is affecting this process and any way you test it, pharmacologic, genetic, and cell autonomous genetic manipulations, we see that it not only blocks the normal slowing or pausing response of these cells, but it actually flips the response at the population level to increase firing instead of decreasing. So I just showed you that ISR activation influences dopamine modulation of cholinergic output. Whether you have more or less activity will inversely change the cholinergic interneuron activity. But we also know that in the striatum, these two neuromodulators are involved in a complex dance in which they influence the activity of each other. To understand whether the cholinergic neuron ISR activity influenced striatal dopamine release, Brandon imaged evoked dopamine using the D-light sensor and two photon imaging of striatal brain slices. To look at the D2R sensitive part of this, he added an antagonist and by subtraction shown here, you can see that lowering ISR activity in SINs led to an enhancement of dopamine release. And this was in marked contrast to what you normally see, which is that D2R suppresses release. Again, flipping the neuromodulatory state in the brain. So this seemed to us to be a pretty big state change that should have behavioral consequences. And so Tori Hall and Miranda Shipman went about testing that. And they tested it using exactly the same behavioral paradigm in which those small molecule ISR inhibitors showed enhanced learning effects. The Morris water maze in which the mouse has to learn to swim and find a submerged hidden platform. Our results were quite shocking to us as you usually only think about this task for its hippocampal contribution. But as you can see from the data, so too do the striatal cholinergic interneurons matter. In other words, neuromodulators matter. So I'm just gonna skim over this particular part because it's a bit for aficionados, but because of how we think about what the basal ganglia circuitry contributes to behavior, our interpretation of the Morris water maze enhancing learning is such that rather than necessarily being smarter, we actually think it's modulating a speed component of the, uh, of the task that is getting them to the Morris water maze uh, platform faster. Here you can see velocity. And when we do other classic basal ganglia tasks, here the lever press task, we again see 
if we inhibit the ISR selectively in cholinergic interneurons, over time they learn to press faster. But this is not associated with hyperactivity in general because if we just look at their open field exploration behavior, they have a normal velocity. So we think that the cholinergic interneurons are leading to uh, assigning increased vigor specifically to the learned tasks. But just at a high level summary, the world is not always as our preconceptions lead us to believe. By creating spotlight and getting a new view of biology, we've upended the synaptic focus for ISR inhibitor effects and suggest neuromodulation as a potent mechanism. So I hope I've stayed on time. I'd like to end to acknowledge the team. The two first authors of this study are here, but this was really, during the pandemic, a real challenge for this uh, study to be completed and was a whole team effort. And here we are celebrating uh, when we finally got the revision accepted. So um, it's been uh, a challenge, but also a nice joy to get this work done. And it's really an honor to share it with our local community at Duke. And I welcome your questions. Thank you, Nicole. That was tremendous and, and uh, tremendous to be able to to watch your celebration as well. Um, so we have a Q&A window for people to submit questions and we have a few minutes before we're scheduled to pick up with Dr. Vulcan's talk. So I, I'm gonna just um, use my privilege to just ask you about the thing that you found the most surprising um, in thinking about the um, your preconceived ideas and which one you think was the most wrong. So, we're all trying to get less wrong, right? Well, everybody see, sees where synaptic plasticity is for this protein synthesis pathway and thought it was acting in those cells. And there's a big possibility that it could be acting by maintaining the excitability of the cholinergic neuron and influencing. So there were recordings of LTP and LTD here and there and all these behaviors, but all this just showed that um, the cholinergic interneurons can enhance learning, just like you saw with your with Jahuo's poster that having a little boost of dup dopamine doesn't hurt us uh, from remembering uh, things when we're in a heightened state of curiosity. So this is really toggling cholinergic tone. These yep. drugs are going through clinical trials for cognitive uh, disorders like Down syndrome, traumatic brain injury. Um, and it's interesting because they were promoted as LTP promoting drugs, but if they, the current drugs for dementia are procholinergics by inhibiting right. acetylcholinesterase. And so I just right. showed you, this is a nuance on procholinergia. It's sort of hypercholinergia, but just in this dopamine neuromodulatory state, the st cell starts to fire a lot more instead of less. So it's yep. kind of an interesting uh, twist that maybe it'll be just another angle in it um, promoting uh, acetylcholine dopamine neuromodulation in the brain for its cognitive benefits. Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a great lesson. Yeah. So we have a question in the chat or in the, um, it says, what kind of behavioral or pharmaceutical interventions increase ISR inhibitions? Well, it's, so the part I, if I understand that, um, Things that increase ISR, the part, the reason we cared about it is we found in a whole bunch of forms of the movement disorder dystonia that there were genetics and uh, pathway inhibition of the ISR. So we think this movement disorder is an ISR inhibited state. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are a variety of cell stressors that might inhibit it, but that's uh, causal for the disease. So we're trying to untangle that right now, which uh, also prompted us to develop the reporter and see what it's doing and where it's doing it in the brain. And um, cholinergic neurons are big in the basal ganglia circuits for dystonia and anticholinergic drugs are what help that movement disorder. So you definitely have two, two sides from enhancing cognition to uh, affecting its role in other circuits. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Palin Vulcan. Um, so Palin is Associate Professor of Biology in the Trinity Ar uh, College of Arts and Sciences and a Cowley Fellow. She's gonna to talk to us about chromatin-based reprogramming of sex-specific behaviors with social experience. Um, she, her research uh, is 
mainly focused on understanding how the brain is shaped by development and experience using fly olfactory systems, odor response systems. And her laboratory has identified molecular programs that govern neuronal diversity and wiring patterns in the fly olfactory system, as well as how these programs are modified by sensory experiences during behavioral adaptation. She got her PhD here um, in North Carolina from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and did postdoctoral studies with Larry Zapersky at UCLA. So um, first of all, I would like to start by thanking Dips for this uh, wonderful symposium and giving me the opportunity to present some of the recent work from my lab. So my lab is interested in understanding how development and environment uh, regulate neural circuit structure and function that determine behavioral outputs. We know that during development, gene expression programs assemble circuits in the brain for innate behaviors, but we also know that there's a huge contribution of the environment and environmental cues on behavioral modulation. So this probably has become even more salient for many people in the past year, particularly with many people experiencing the effects of um, social isolation on brain function like memory problems, depression, anxiety, and irritability. Um, in addition to effects on general health. So today I will tell you a little bit about how these gene regulatory programs change with social experience to modulate circuit function and behaviors. So animals need to modulate execution of their social behaviors such as reproduction, uh, parenting and aggression based on signals from their social environment. And this is absolutely critical for their evolutionary fitness. However, the molecular mechanisms of how social experience affects gene expression to modulate circuit function and behaviors remains less clear. So to study this question, one ideally needs a system where there's a very clear link between genes and circuits and behaviors. So you need a robust quantifiable behavior with a well-defined neural circuit map and critical genes that regulate the structure and function of that circuit as well as the behavioral output. And the odor-guided um, sex-specific behaviors and fruit flies are an excellent model system um, to study this question. So fly sex-specific behaviors, particularly male courtship behaviors are very stereotypical. So here you're seeing a male um, kind of pursuing a female chasing her and also singing her a uh, courtship song by sticking out one of its wings. And this behavior has both innate and learned components that are guided by odors and pheromones. Um, and uh, these behaviors are also controlled by characterized genetic components. So one of the uh, critical genes that regulate this male courtship behavior is a gene called uh, fruitless. So fruitless is a very critical behavioral switch gene. Um, it encodes a transcription factor that regulates the expression of thousands of neurodevelopmental and neuromodulatory genes. So it really regulates the structure and function of these courtship circuits. Um, so the, when you look at the gene structure, you see it has a pretty complex gene structure with multiple um, promoter elements, as well as multiple alternative isoforms. But particularly the transcripts that are from the P1 promoter are all six specifically spliced in, um, in males and females. And it's only the male forms of these splice isoforms that actually make functional proteins. And we know that these different isoforms of male specific uh, fruitless have different but uh, related sets of target genes that they uh, regulate. And of course, most importantly, uh, fruitless is uh, necessary and sufficient for driving male courtship behaviors. So if you look at a fruitless mutant male, um, these males are completely impaired in courtship if they're raised in isolation, they don't court anyone. But you can also see these males courting other males if they're grouped with other males. So here you're seeing a chain of males, they are co-courting each other, and this is a behavior that we called male-male chaining. We also can generate females that carry the male isoforms of fruitless, and these females completely acquire the male-specific behaviors by starting to court other females. And here you can see this female actually generating a courtship song. So such an important gene, where is it expressed? So this again is another fascinating aspect of this um, fruitless gene. It seems to act like a molecular label that lights up the neural circuits driving these sex specific behaviors. It's expressed in approximately 2000 interconnected neurons that we know the circuit diagram of in the brain. 
For example, if we look at the fruitless expressing neurons in the sensory, uh, uh, peripheral sensory circuits like the olfactory system, these fruitless expressing neurons connect to other neurons that express fruitless. Those neurons connect to um, further, you know, a deeper in the brain to other fruitless expressing neurons in the central circuits that um, are responsible for decision making and the motor pathways that actually eventually execute the courtship actions. And many of these neurons were shown to be involved in different, in regulating different aspects of male courtship behaviors. So if you look at, for example, OR67D neurons in the peripheral olfactory system, these neurons are responsible for detecting male-specific pheromones, and they also mediate male-male courtship as well as increasing, um, um, they, they, they repress male-male courtship and they increase male-male aggression. If you look at OR47B neurons, on the other hand, they detect pheromones coming from both males and females. And these neurons have a more modulatory role on courtship behaviors by adjusting um, the competitive copulation advantage with different population density. So coming back to social experience, as with many animal species in flies, social experience affects male specific behaviors such as courtship, copulation advantage, as well as aggression. They also modulate neuronal responses and many of these effects of social experience have been shown to be dependent on the male isoform of fruitless. So then the question that we were interested in is understanding how social and pheromonal cues affect fruitless gene regulation and function and how does this eventually modulate circuit responses and the behavioral outputs. So gene expression can be modulated at many levels, and I will mostly focus on chromatin states today, which can exist as either transcriptionally repressed heterochromatin or active um, euchromatin. So modification to histone proteins uh, around which DNA is wrapped around, such as acetylation or methylation of histones, can change these chromatin states and accessibility of the genes to the transcriptional machinery. And chromatin states are known to influence many aspects of gene regulation from the onset of transcription to transcriptional speed, as well as splice regulation. In addition, chromatin mediated changes can be reversible and relatively quick responses to neural activity and sensory experience. So what we asked is if there are any chromatin based mechanisms for regulating fruitless and how do they contribute to neuronal and behavioral modulation in response to social experience. So we first analyzed the pheromone sensing neurons in the peripheral olfactory system. So we knew from past work from the Wang lab that grouping males increases the pheromone responses of OR47B neurons, whereas social isolation um, decreases their pheromone responses. This relationship is reversed for OR67D neurons where grouping basically decreases these pheromone responses, whereas isolation increases them. At least in the case of OR47B, we knew that these changes in pheromone responses with social experience depend on the male isoform of fruitless. So you can knock down fruitless in group house males only in these 47B neurons, and this decreases their pheromone responses. Or you can overexpress fruitless in socially isolated males, again, only in these 47B neurons, and this increases their pheromone responses. And these modulation of the pheromone responses help modulate the co copulation competitive advantage in different population densities. So we first looked at the active chromatin marks at uh, fruitless, fruitless promoter in the antenna where these neurons are uh, located and how they change with social experience. First of all, we find that grouping increases the enrichment of uh, these two marks that we looked at, RNA polymerase and acetylated H3 um, histone 3 K27. And um, so this enrichment in response to group housing is decreased when these males are socially isolated. And it seems like 47B has more of an activating function on the chromatin because if you mutate 47B, this enrichment goes down. And 67D again is opposite to 47B where it seems to have a more repressive role on chromatin because if we look at 67D mutants, we see that this enrichment is further increased even more than the group house males. 
We can also knock down the enzyme that acetylates um, H3K27, which is uh, P300 CBP. So if we knock down CBP specifically in 47B neurons, we can decrease these acetylated um, active histone marks. And this also is associated with a decrease in the pheromone responses in 47B neurons. So interestingly, we also find that these chromatin alterations we find at the peripheral um, olfactory system can cascade through the central nervous system um, to the central circuits um, in the brain. So here we're again looking at the enrichment of RNA polymerase. We find that group housing males together in the brain shows an increase in um, the enrichment of this active mark at the fruitless promoters and social isolation decreases it. And we also know that these are reversible. So if we take isolated males and regroup them, we can recover this enrichment. Interestingly, we also find that grouping males with males versus females have different effects on this chromatin state. So if we see that this enrichment is only present if the males are grouped together with other males, but not if we group males together with females, suggesting that somehow these flies are detecting the male pheromones from the peripheral system, and then these are changing these, altering these chromatin effect, chromatin marks in the central brain. And in agreement with this, if we actually eliminate the function of, a, of OR67D, which detects the male uh, pheromones, we find that this group house enriched uh, enrichment, group housing induced enrichment of RNA polymerase is completely abolished and 47B mutants don't have an effect. So what these suggest is that social experience and pheromone signaling seem to alter fruitless chromatin in both the peripheral and central circuits of the courtship um, behaviors. So what are the transcriptional consequences of this chromatin modulation and how do they modulate neuronal responses? So to, to identify these differentially expressed genes, we perform transcriptional profiling from the male antenna, um, either from wild-type males that are either grouped or single-housed, as well as mutate mutants in pheromone receptors OR67D and OR47B, as well as fruitless mutants. So we first looked at fruitless, but initially when we looked through the entire uh, fruitless transcripts, uh, we didn't see any drastic changes in the total transcript reads from fruitless. However, we found interesting alterations in the levels of specific exons compared to the wild type group housing, suggesting maybe possible changes in splice patterns with uh, social and pheromonal experience. So let's start with um, fruitless mutants. So uh, we know that the fruitless mutants we were using um, specifically disrupt male specific exon and indeed we find that the male exon expression is drastically down in these mutants but we also find that other exons seem to be differentially regulated throughout the rest of the fruitless gene. Social isolation seems to have the least amount of effect with only a small effect seen in an increase in this female specific exon over here and the pheromone receptors we looked at, both of them seem to affect this, uh, these uh, exon usage patterns as well. So for 47B, we see a decrease in the male um, exon as well as the uh, promoter that drives this male specific exon, as well as a drastic increase in one of these common exons that we find over here. So 6070 has generally similar effects, but slight differences um, in other exons, suggesting that these, you know, social experience and pheromone signaling seem to alter um, levels of specific uh, fruitless exons um, within the gene, which might, um, you know, which might be associated with maybe splice regulation, which we're looking at right now. So in addition to fruitless, many of the genes that uh, were differentially expressed in each situation belong to groups of neuromodulatory genes that are involved in either ion or membrane transport, as well as ion channels. And all of these genes would potentially have a role in regulating physiological properties of um, neurons. So for example, um, this heat map is showing you the differential expression of one of these neuromodulatory gene families in mutants compared to wild type group housed antenna. And these are the genes that encode uh, pickpocket um, uh, family of sodium channels. And these genes have known effects on membrane potentials and excitability, and particularly pickpocket 25 um, has a known fruitless dependent neuromodulatory role in OR47B neuron responses to its pheromones. <clears throat> 
Again, many of these genes have binding sites for many of the uh, male isoforms of uh, fruitless. And we do actually find that in fruitless mutants, many of these genes are um, differentially regulated. Some are upregulated and some are downregulated. It seems like the same genes are also altered, usually in the same direction in the pheromone receptor mutants as well. But in some cases, um, some of these genes are only altered in OR67D mutants, whereas others are altered in OR47B mutants. But then there are some that are altered in all, um, both uh, pheromone receptor mutants. So what these results suggest that pheromone signaling um, social experience alters the expression of fruitless regulated uh, neuromodulatory genes, which might contribute to neuronal risk differences in neuronal responses. So what I told you so far is that you know, it seems like social and pheromonal signals induce chromatin-based changes in fruitless regulation in both peripheral and central um, circuits of courtship behaviors. And these might affect uh, the splice isoforms of fruitless. And we think that these, uh, you know, these kinds of regulatory changes changes the function of the fruitless protein, which uh, lead to uh, modulation of downstream target neuromodulatory gene expression, which eventually affect the circuit neuronal responses as well as circuit responses and ultimately behaviors. So these were mostly innate behaviors I talked about, but what about the learned aspects of courtship? So I told you in the beginning that fruitless mutant males court other males, but this only happens if these males are group housed together. If we look at socially isolated fruitless mutants, these don't court at all. So if you group fruitless mutants with other flies, they basically use olfaction by detecting fly pheromones to learn to court with flies around them. And this is regardless of the sex. So if you group these fruitless mutants with males, they learn to court with males. If you group them with females, they learn to court with females and even other species of Drosophila that Melanogaster doesn't normally court with. So a number of years ago, Bruce Baker's lab has shown that this learning requires the function of a second gene in the sex determination pathway called double sex. And this gene is co-expressed with fruitless in these central decision-making neurons um, in the courtship circuits in the brain. So if you make double mutants of fruitless and double sex, these males do not learn to court. And I also told you that this learning requires olfaction and a social experience. So if you make fruitless mutants that are also genetically smell blind, these males also don't learn to court. So what these suggest, studies have suggested is that in the wild type, presence of both fruitless and double sex mediate the innate aspects of courtship that do not necessarily rely on experience. But in, in, in the absence of fruitless, double sex takes over and um, mediates learned aspects of uh, courtship by um, using olfactory and social experience. So of course, uh, we were very interested in asking whether um, social experience also alters double sex chromatin in both wild type and fruitless mutant central brain, similar to the alterations we see with fruitless. So we again looked at enrichment of um, you know, active chromatin marks in the central brain. And what we find is that again, grouping males together increases the enrichment of particularly RNA polymerase II in the central brain, not so much the acetylated histone and social isolation decreases it. So interestingly, what we find is that uh, when we look at group house fruitless mutant brains, we see that uh, we still see an increase in the enrichment of open chromatin marks around double sex. And this is particularly salient for this acetylated histone, suggesting that social experience can activate double sex chromatin and mediate courtship learning um, in fruitless mutant males. So the next question is, what are the olfactory pheromone sensing pathways that contribute to this learning? So we first looked at OR47B since it detects both male and female pheromones. And what we found is that this group house induced um, enrichment of these active chromatin marks we see in fruitless mutants are dampened if we actually take out the function of this pheromone receptor out, um, out of the picture. So these are fruitless OR47B double mutants, and then we completely alter this. And uh, this also affects the learning, um, as we can see. So what we, what in conclusion, uh, what I showed you is that, uh, you know, um, so, so basically, um, you know, uh, I told you about how sensing the social environment regulates behavioral switchings like fruitless 
nucleus and double sex in the central brain. And we have these different pheromone circuits that, um, you know, um, it, you know it relay different types of information about the social environment to the central brain. And activity of any of the neurons within these circuits basically have differential effects on chromatin around fruitless. And this changes the function of the fruitless gene, which leads to reprogramming of neuromodulatory gene expression and ultimately changes in um, circuit responses and behavioral neuromodulation. And with that, I would like to thank the people who did this work. So this was initiated by a postdoc, Doug, and a graduate student, Catherine, a few years ago in the lab, and then taken over by Sangmi, Bryson, and um, Chang Chang, and other graduate students, and some uh, undergrad help. Of course, collaborators, uh, you know, with bioinformatics and electrophysiology, reagents and money. And this is the lab uh, 2019 Christmas where everybody's uh, super happy, but this is how we look um, nowadays. <laughs> Hopefully it will be gone soon. And thank you very much for your attention. I will um, ask you to, to think a little bit about the, um, the sort of interaction of Social and um, social cues and and uh, the specificity to circuits and whether any of what you observed was surprising to you all. Well, I mean, I think the one thing that I was really surprised to see is this, you know, this cascading of these chromatin changes from the periphery to the central circuits. And I think, you know, that's one of them. Yeah, that, you know, I, I really didn't expect to see that. I thought these would be all like cell based um, at the point of the uh, pheromone sensing neurons, but it seems like just because fruitless is in this interconnected circuit, so every neuron that expresses fruitless are interconnected to one another. So the moment you neuromodulate one of those neurons that can cascade through the rest of the circuit, changing the activity of the next neuron, which affects cr fruitless chromatin again, and the next neuron. So you can get this like flow of this okay. neuromodulation from the periphery to the central circuits and likely to the descending motor pathways. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the most fascinating thing that I um, you know, didn't expect to find, but it you know, turned out to be correct so far. Yeah, it's really amazing how all of these um, related uh, functions are respecting this distinction. It's really a, a, a amazing. So our next speaker is Michael Tadros, who's assistant professor of biomedical engineering, who's going to talk about deconstructing behavioral neuropharmacology. Uh, Dr. Tadros is um, developing technologies to target clinical drugs to experimentally define cells and synapses in the brain and apply the methods to mouse models of neuropsychiatric disease. He received his bachelor's in electrical and computer engineering at Rutgers, an MD, PhD in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins, and completed a postdoc in cellular neuroscience at Stanford. Um, and he began his independent research career as a fellow at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Genelia Research Campus. You know, I, I just sort of, I, I like to sort of take a step back and, and take stock of where we are. Um, and first, it just sort of occurred to me that this is, uh, this is National Women's Month. And, I realized, hey, I'm the only guy presenting, and I'm bookended um, by Nicole Palin and, and Eve to come later, and that really kind of makes me happy, right? That 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 um, you know, just to see this contribution of women in science, and it particularly makes me feel um, special to present before Eve because you know her her work really has impacted me uh, in, in in many ways. Um, and she has, you know, I, I thought about doing many quotes of hers that have really uh, been memorable, but I think we can save that for, for maybe another time. Um, so I think it goes without saying that the brain is really just fascinating. It's just remarkably complex. Um, it's remarkably important. It is, you know, the brain, brain disorders are not the number one cause of death, but they are the number one cause of disability. Um, and so you know, it would be great if we could start to make some progress in treating disorders of the brain. And, you know, I think we could all agree that that's been very difficult. And one of the reasons uh, is just because of the, the really unique architecture of the brain. And basically, unlike any other organ, you know, the brain's not the only organ that uses action potentials and uses electrical signaling, but it is really special. It is unmatched in the complexity by which the different neurons talk to each other through synapses. Um, a way that you could think about that is, you know, if you are in a heart, 
if you were in a community that made a heart, you would only talk to your immediate neighbors, all right? And that would be your social network. But if you are in a brain, then you have, you know, you have people that you interact with across the world, you have social media. And I think we could agree that the, the dynamics that emerge from those more complex connections is very interesting. Now, the challenge in understanding that is it's been really tough to get at uh, what these different uh, functions of these synapses and these different connections are in the brain. There have been some ways to do it. So for example, um, pharmacology, uh, almost all pharmacology that has a very interesting impact on the brain acts at some sort of receptor that is involved in cell-cell communication. A challenge with that though, is that the same receptor shows up all over the place. So it's sort of like a module. It would be as if you took out all cell phones you know, in, in, in the world. Yes, that would be a way to interrupt some sort of person-to-person -person communication, but it wouldn't be specific to specific individuals. Now, there are other techniques that are genetic. So for example, you could use optogenetics to make a neuron fire but that would just sort of hijack a neuron's, uh, the, the, the way a neuron speaks. It wouldn't allow you to tune the way a neuron listens to other members of the brain. Um, and then finally, you could do genetic manipulations. So for example, you could imagine telling this neuron to stop making the purple protein. The challenge there is, you know, you get a lot of compensatory changes. So the brain is just so plastic that by the time this protein, this purple protein disappears, so many other things will have changed in the brain that it becomes sort of this domino effect of complexity and it's almost impossible to figure out what's going on. So what my lab did was to basically ask whether we can use some sort of engineering technology to help address this issue. And we reasoned that pharmacology was a really great place to start given its close link with human disease and how we treat disease. Uh, and also given that it has a nice combination of specificity for a given receptor and fast enough onset that you can interpret the results. There isn't enough time for complexity to kick in. Um, and the way we did it was to basically specifically not change anything about the native proteins, but instead uh, use genetic engineering to put in an artificial protein that we could, uh, dis we could express this on any cell of interest. I'm showing it only at the synapse here, but we could just basically use cell type specific viral tools to put this tag into any cell that we choose. What that allows you to do then is just take, take advantage of the normal dose response uh, properties of all drugs. That is, if you take a traditional drug and deliver it at an ambient concentration that's low enough, it won't do much. A low dose drug doesn't do very much. But uh, if we attach the drug to a leash with a small targeting motif, that specifically gets captured by our engineered protein, we could then cause the concentration to become very, very high locally on this one cell. In, in essence, we could have a acute cell type specific delivery of a drug. All right, so that's nice, but what about uh, if you wanted to affect the purple protein versus the green protein? Well, that's the beauty of drugs because drugs already can distinguish between different proteins. So with a simple system, with one virus, we'd be able to deliver any drug we want on different days. Uh, and on one day, we could manipulate the green protein. On a different day, we could manipulate the purple protein. And I think you could start to imagine that this would give us a lot of uh, ability to start to deconstruct some of how these cell-cell these communications are working. So just to show you the first data, here's um, a picture of two cells, two neurons in culture. They both have an indicator that shows us um, when they respond. And we're, we've designed the conditions so that we're basically driving them with excitatory uh, synaptic uh, drive. And right now, both neurons are listening to this synaptic input. They're both responding. And now we're going to deliver, at a very low dose, a, uh, an AMPA receptor antagonist dart. And you can almost see it accumulating on one cell and having a very quick effect on just one cell and not the other. Now, a nice thing about this is that if we did the same experiment with this, these same two cells, if we used a normal drug, the drug would not distinguish between them. In fact, the native receptors are completely normal, unaltered. Um, and another interesting thing is if we then switched to exciting this same cell with a different receptor, for example, the NMD, NMDA receptor, uh, our amper specific DART would not do anything. So in other words, we are really tuning the way this one cell listens to a specific stream of input 
and we're not altering uh, everything about this neuron. Okay, so that's a really unique uh, feature. So to test if this works in vivo, we just started off in the in the striatum. Uh, the striatum is an important part of the brain for motor function. It's involved in diseases like Parkinson's disease. And um, we took advantage of uh, mice, mouse lines that allow us to express a virus in either the direct pathway neurons or the indirect pathway neurons. And we wondered whether delivering an amperoceptor antagonist to one cell type or the other could cause different behaviors. All right, very simple question. And we did it on one side of the brain to increase the chance that we could induce a bias turn in one way or the other, okay? So here's what happened right after we infused our AMPA antagonist dart into a mouse, uh, a D1 pre-mouse. So this is one cell population. And the mouse turns to the left. And below is the exact same manipulation, the same dose of drug. The only difference is this mouse is expressing our virus in the other cell population. Okay. And I think you could appreciate that these mice are, a lot of what they're doing is kind of normal looking, but when they choose to turn, the top mouse turns uh, to the left, the bottom mouse turns to the right. Um, and so that's really interesting. And so before infusion of the, of the dart, uh, the mice are turning equally both directions. Immediately after infusion uh, of this compound, uh, the, the D1 mice are turning to the left about 100 turns per hour. The D2 mice are turning the opposite direction, about 100 turns per hour. The same dose of this drug uh, with a control virus basically does nothing, has no behavioral effect, right? So altogether, this is really special in that it was the first time that a drug that resembles a clinical drug had ever been uh, targeted to drive behavior uh, one way or the other. And we could actually show that clinical drugs actually have competing effects, even within a given piece of brain tissue, right? So that's really kind of interesting. So what sorts of questions could we get at with this? Well, the striatum has these two cells, the D1 cells and the D2 cells. These have been studied a lot with many techniques. Um, so optogenetics has really uh, been useful in this regard. So for example, optogenetics made it possible to make all the D1 cells fire in response to light in some animals or make all the D2 cells fire in response to light. In other words, the optogenetics allows you to hijack the way these neurons speak and to make them fire in a very you know, on-demand pattern. The odd thing about those experiments though, which makes them a little bit hard, I mean, it's really kind of ground truth data, but what makes that a little bit hard to put in context is that the patterns of activity that, that you drive in that way are, are quite unnatural. And so you can imagine that you would have, you know, say, 10,000 D1 cells all firing together, that usually doesn't happen. And in fact, when you record from the striatum, you typically see very sparse patterns of activity, very few cells, um, and usually similar ratios of D1 and D2 cells, right? So, um, so what we were wondering well, was, well, if instead of just driving the output of these neurons, if we could tune how they listen to different kinds of synaptic input, we might be able to get at slightly different questions, okay? And so we know that different brain circuits get all sorts of different streams of input. Um, and so this is sort of that connectome idea. So you have all sorts of other neurons in different places of the brain communicating to neurons in the striatum. You have some glutamate neurons that are sending what I like to think of as data, sort of like the cortex is giving information about sensory and motor commands. You have dopamine inputs that are giving information related to kind of like um, more emotional components things like motivation, drive, reward. Um, and so what the striatum does in essence is it, it does a mapping from glutamate and dopamine into D1 and D2 sorts of outputs. And what we reasoned was, well, we could start to maybe use DART to interrogate these synapses uh, to try to understand how the striatum maps inputs to outputs, right? How does it transform information to drive behavior? Okay, and in a way what we did in the experiments I showed you was to, to show that, well, it's not only the D1 versus D2 activity that matters, it's actually their responsiveness to glutamate input that also matters in terms of choosing which way to turn. Now, this could be really interesting in, in studying certain diseases. So for example, Parkinson's disease that I mentioned before involves, it's known to involve the loss of dopamine cells, right? So what that means is you've, you've lost dopamine inputs to the striatum, the striatum itself, uh, there's no real cell death. 
in the striatum, it's just simply lost one of its distance, distant uh, uh, advisors, and it's no longer getting this information about sort of emotional content. It's still getting all of its hard data information. Now, we know that Parkinson's disease involves major, massive uh, deficits in movement. And, you know, it's, it's essentially gone unquestioned that dopamine direct, the loss of dopamine directly causes the, the, the movement issues. However, uh, I would argue that that causality is a little bit, the mechanism of that causality is a little bit hard to understand. So, for example, you know, we could ask, well, does dopamine directly, is dopamine directly necessary to have really good movement? In other words, is dopamine the domino that directly causes movement, or is it acting through a very complex domino effect to later cause movement way down the line? Um, and this has really been a hotly debated question. And in the context of Parkinson's disease specifically, you know, um, the dopamine neurons are gone for a long time. And that allows the brain many, many days, months, uh, years to adapt. And the changes in, a, in the striatum of a Parkinson's animal, a Parkinson's human, um, are, are known to be really complex. And even at the level of uh, excitatory cortical to striatal synaptic strength, we know that a Parkinsonian striatum has an increase in the coupling between cortical cells and D2 cells and a decrease in the coupling from cortex to D1 cells. And so this sort of begs the question of, well, are these changes sort of unrelated to the disorder of Parkinson's disease? Are these changes the brain's effort to counteract the loss of dopamine? Or are these in fact one of the dominoes in a causal chain between the loss of dopamine and movement? All right, and so here we reasoned, well, you know, with, with our AMPA antagonist art, we could ask this question directly by taking a Parkinson's mouse and attenuating the AMPA receptor specifically on the D2 cells. And I want to emphasize that this would not replace dopamine, and it would very precisely be restoring one synapse strength back to how it was before. Now, if it's true that dopamine is necessary for movement, this should never be able to restore movement because we would not be restoring dopamine. Also, if you assume that the brain is smart enough that its homeostatic mechanisms would be adaptive, if anything, undoing this, it would be sort of like ripping a scab off of a, of a wound. It should probably make it worse, right? So uh, not thinking much more about it, we just went ahead and did the experiment. So it's very straightforward to model this. In a mouse, you can lesion all the dopamine neurons on one side of the brain. This is a hemi-Parkinsonian mouse. Here, we're showing a picture that all of the dopamine fibers that are normally quite dense in a normal striatum are now absent on the, on the affected side. And now we've uh, expressed our DART virus in those D2 spiny projection neurons. We allow for all the homeostatic changes to occur over many weeks. And now we're, without restoring dopamine at all, we simply can reduce the synaptic strength onto the D2 cells and ask what happens. So here's uh, a video of a mouse where uh, on the left is a lesion mouse that's been stable for, for several weeks. And you can see that its movements are very unnatural. It uh, spends about a quarter of its time stuck in place, and that's uh, comparable to this akinesia phenotype. And its body, its, its entire body is contorted to the left such that it could only create these very narrow pathological turns to the left. Now on the right is the exact same mouse just a few moments later that still has zero dopamine on the affected side of the brain. And the only thing we did was deliver a bit of an AMPA antagonist to the D2 cells. And I think you could appreciate that this mouse is moving around quite well. And it is almost kind of normal. It could turn to the right, it could turn to the left, it doesn't freeze anymore. And that was really surprising to us because we did not restore dopamine. Um, and in fact, we undid one of the changes that occurs in response to the loss of dopamine, right? And so this really suggests that in fact, you might not need dopamine to move. Um, and you know, it could be that the role of dopamine is to simply keep the homeostatic set point of glutamatergic synapses at the right value. And perhaps if we could intervene directly at the level of the connectome, we might have a different class of therapies for these different disorders. So to summarize the data, uh, before a lesion, mice normally turn to the left and to the right, and these are histograms showing the diameter of each turn and how often they happen. So it's usually pretty symmetrical and usually large diameter. When you lesion the dopamine on one side, they now can only turn one direction and these narrow turns. 
they also freeze about 10 times more, about 25% of the time. And what I just showed you was that a very acute uh, antagonism of AMPA receptors on D2 cells is therapeutic. And a few days later, when the drug wears off, the, the deficits come back. So this is clearly causal. What about the other cells, the D1 cells? Well, if we deliver the same drug to those cells, we were surprised to see that it does nothing to the behavior. Um, but altogether, this suggests that maybe an AMPA antagonist would be beneficial. And in fact, there had been human clinical trials testing exactly this question. Of what about an AMPA receptor for Parkinson's patients? And when we looked at this, we found that in fact, uh, if you look at just the freezing component, the D2 cell effect seemed to dominate. In other words, a good thing plus nothing equaled a good thing. But if you looked at all the other parameters, all of the benefit that you got from delivering the drug to the D2 cells seemed to be occluded by co-delivery to the D1 cells. Um, in other words, if you could just deliver the drug to fewer cells, you could have higher efficacy, right? And so that's a really kind of not obvious idea, but one that kind of makes sense if you think of the circuitry, right? So now, what are some other questions? So how does this change the way we think of Parkinson's disease? Well, first of all, you know, in a dopamine depleted state, the striatum is not where the dopamine cell bodies live. And so the cell bodies in the striatum are all still there. They're all still fairly healthy um, and still active or still able to, to take inputs and map them to outputs. But we know that there's a lot of changes to the connectome. And these had been known to exist. They had been observed. They, they were a correlate of disease, but we didn't know the causality, right? And so now what we've been able to show is that, in fact, these hyper, uh, these extra strong synapses onto the ISPNs, the D2 cells, is actually part of the causal process of, of the disease. And if you think about the turning deficit, you could, you could think of it as sort of a seesaw idea where uh, in order to normalize this, you'd want to lighten the load just on one side. If you lighten the load on both sides, that, would, that wouldn't restore the imbalance. Now, uh, I'll try to hurry up here, but basically, you know, glutamate synapses are not the only thing that change in the connectome. There are massive changes to the GABAergic interconnections. And if you focus in on just one specific change, this fast spiking interneuron to ISPNs, that one seems to get stronger in Parkinson's disease. And you know, if you think about this imbalance model, stronger inhibition might counteract the stronger excitation. And you would think, well, this one better be homeostatic. This one better be adaptive. Now, the counter argument to that would be that, well, these FSI to ISPN synapses are known to be synchronizing. And so they might be contributing to these beta oscillations in some way. Okay? And so we want to test that. Um, and uh, I'll just zip through quickly. Basically, we want to distinguish this synapse from these synapses. And to get at that, we have developed tools that uh, basically allow us to target darts to specific compartments of the cell. Specifically, the soma is where the FSI to ISPN synapses uh, target. Okay? So I'll skip over some other things. We have new darts. We have dart 2.0. We have GABA darts. We have ways to deliver darts non-invasively. We have many, many, many drugs. Uh, it's a very modular system. Um, and so I'm happy to talk to other folks. But uh, for the interest of time, I'll wrap up here and thank my wonderful lab. Uh, it's 12 strong, and we are well-funded by NIH, uh, by DIBS, uh, and by other organizations, including the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. I'm going to um, just invite everybody to think about all of the talks together um, and um, invite uh, comments from our panelists on each other's talks. Mike, I'm obviously a big fan of both the insights and therapeutic potentials of your approach. You've got, when you were mentioning the D2 potentiation, a lot of times uh, AMPA potentiation uses different set, subunits. Is there anything known about whether they're GLUA2 lacking and you might be able to get at it before we have a DART implementable approach with something that was uh, receptor subtype selective drugs? Because I think that trial was Parampanel or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The, the trial was Parampanel, but I think, um, I don't know. I, you know, I, that's worth looking further into. So what is known is in certain sorts of uh, addictive disorders in the ventral striatum, you know, when, when you have an increase in AMPA, it's usually calcium permeable. So we are making a NASPEM dart, which is blocked specifically the calcium permeable subset of AMPA receptors. Um, in Parkinson's disease, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I, I'm not sure if anyone has looked, but it's a great question. Mike, it was a really lovely talk. And I have a something that struck me as you were going along. And that is 
as we start treating people pharmacologically um, with any drug for to rectify any other you know previous problem you can imagine that the treatment itself will now trigger homeostatic or other changes and we've always put the the loss of effectiveness of of drugs in for example parkinson's to progression of the disease per se but it also could just be that maybe we should cycle on and off certain therapeutics so that you can recover efficacy or undo some of the, the sequelae of the treatment itself. And I don't know if you've thought about this, but for all of us who are probably taking drugs for very long periods of time, it'd be really interesting to know which ones sort of don't run into um, a triggering of a response that decreases their efficacy and which do. Mm -hmm. That is such a great question that I think about a lot, like every day, <laughs> you know, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, a strange thing with, you know, when you look at the kind of the, the, the way I gave the presentation and talking about dopamine droll, it kind of makes you scratch your head and wonder, well, you know, what is it, what's, ha you know, what's happening when you give levodopa and Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. what's happen happening when you just give a dopamine treatment? And, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but, but one bad thing that happens is that you start to have dyskinesias, right? And in fact, there's, you know, the treatment itself now has a side effect that is itself harmful. And, you know, I, I am tempted to bring up a, a chalkboard and sketch, but, you know, you could think of it as, you could think of all movement as being kind of uh, voluntary movements on those, say, the, X -ax the Y axis and involuntary on the X axis. And we're normally healthy means, you know, as much voluntary movement as you want without any involuntary movement. And, you know, when you give levodopa enough of it, you start to change the, the direction people, you go in. So in other words, more dopamine normally gives you more movement. In a healthy brain, it gives you more voluntary movement. In a diseased brain, now more dopamine starts giving you more involuntary movements before it gives you voluntary movements. And that's really interesting. Um, so why is that? I, I don't know. I would love to find out. I mean, what, one thing we're doing is, you know, we are doing models of levodopa-induced dyskinesia and asking, what treatment would you want to give to that context, right? And so what I would think of it as is that, you know, there is no real one disease. I think that for any given individual person, their disease is going to involve certain changes to certain synaptic weights. When you treat that, it's going to be a moving target. Um, you know, we can explore the idea of whether like an AMPA drug would, would cause less kind of uh, side effects or less connectome changes, less of a domino effect, you know, but for any given patient, you know, it's going to be a moving target. And for that reason, I, I think that, you know, this idea of doing gene therapy is, is kind of scary in a way, because if you imagine doing something like a dread, like a dread in a human being to treat Parkinson's disease, that would be really maybe really great um, and it would probably work and be by, be wonderful for, for, for many people. But then what if their disease changes and now that, that same manipulation isn't really helping them anymore? It's a little bit hard, right? And I think that having the flexibility of delivering different drugs to different cells at different stages is just what doctors are really good at doing, right? <laughs> and so in other words, I just think of every one of these stages as, as a different disease and every single different disease needs a different tuning of, of the treatment. So, I mean, that, that was a very long-winded sort of set of ideas, but the bottom line is, you know, two, two things is one, you could ask the question of which treatments are the most stable. That's number one. And number two is, given that no treatment is perfectly stable, how do we come up with an approach that's flexible enough to keep changing the treatment as needed? Okay. Well, you know, in a funny way, it makes something like DBS, which is as crude as, as unimaginably crude, yeah. more attractive because you can turn it on and off whenever you want. So you could imagine um, you don't have to worry about irreversible changes as you might have with more genetic approaches. You know, you can always just turn it off. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and it's, it's obviously not the ideal thing one wants to be doing, but having something you can turn on and off is is, yeah. is attractive. Yeah, and it's more it's more that I mean, 
you know, you'd not only you'd not only want to be able to turn it on and off, you'd want to be able to change the pattern or something, right? So that you can tune it for the current needs. Um, it is really interesting that DBS does not cause dyskinesias, whereas dopamine treatments do, right? So already there's a hint that, you know, maybe there's a different uh, uh, pharmacological approach that could also treat Parkinson's without inducing dyskinesias, right? It, it seems like there sh it should be possible. You know, that does assume that something that is done on a temporary basis can't have a long-term effect because we do know, you know, <laughs> with kindling and other things um, and actually, you know, with um, TMS, right? And say with autism, you have to be very careful because there is um, sort of an underlying propensity towards seizures and you could actually alter the brain in such a way because it, it assumes that the brain can restabilize itself and i think particularly in vulnerable brains that may not be the case so it it, it, it may be better eve i don't know if it's <laughs> i'm glad better. <laughs> no jerry i'm glad <laughs> none of this is better right <laughs> i'm glad you brought up that point because i was thinking we're going to have to unplast on long-term plasticityify the dbs in some in some circuits brains and situations because for parkinson's tremor it's beautiful and that you turn it on and off and the tremor goes away but it's unclear every circuit and every implementation won't have a longer lasting effect couldn't agree more absolutely go ahead sorry this is just choosing one of a, of a number of all bads, right? right? I mean. And you have to add to the bad, the fact that, you know, having the condition is also modifying the brain. And, you know, we think about this with major depressive disorder and other things where, you know, um, or even, you know, epilepsy and the fact that the more you have these things, um, the more, you know, stabilized they can become and uh, impairing. So, um, you know, often you're choosing between the impact of the condition on the brain versus the impact of the- Of course, you know, yes. But of course there are other cases where you can take someone who has a seizure disorder and then treat it and then slowly eventually wean them off the drug, yeah. they become drug free. You know, so again, it, it, this goes back, every individual is different. So I've seen people with major me mental illnesses basically become almost drug free after a long enough time and, and seizure disorders. And other times they just get worse and worse, right? So, you know, all of the above. I mean, one would hope that the homeostatic mechanisms, if you could use pharmacology to get you close enough the homeostatic mechanisms could could maybe bring you back to a more normal operating range. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. Right, so I guess I guess that was my question. I mean, like with all these drugs, you end up changing, I mean, your neurons basically become dependent on those drugs to you know function normally. So if there was any way of like bringing in some, I guess TMS kind of works in this a little bit, not really, but like, is there a way to bring in some sensory based like therapies that can actually use the brain's you know, own mechanism to you know, regulate these kinds of neural, you know, these neurochemicals, you know, to secrete them and to basically try treating. And I guess kind of goes to this cognitive behavioral therapy for some of the diseases, you know, you can do this. It takes time, but at least, you know, like for, for those of us who have been on, you know, pharmaceuticals, you know, like getting off of those can be, you know, it brings back a lot of the problems. Well, we, we can't expect the drugs to do the learning that we need to do. Exactly, exactly. So it's like a kind of a quick way and a lazy way to fix some of these, which we do need drugs for some of them. But like, I'm wondering if there are any sensory based therapies that people can come up with to activate the circuit so that you fire these or produce these chemicals with your own brain. Yeah. Uh, you. You remind me of some of the examples. I'm pretty sure it's in the OCD literature and in Tourette's literature. There's some beautiful work of clinical trials supporting CBT and SSRIs. But if you add them, they're not additives, suggesting that it's occluded and that they're acting in similar pathways, which I always think is yeah. Um, yeah. a cool example if you, if yeah. you want to know what the mechanisms are. And I would just like to add the very my own personal looking from the, the side of 
small circuits. All thinking about all this would be a whole lot easier if we actually understood more about how normal brain circuits in humans work. I mean, we know so little about how the dynamics of the brain occur. It's really hard to think about therapeutics in a rational way. So you end up with what a neurologist does, which is try the thing that worked in his last patient. Yeah. In her last patient. And her last patient. <laughs> We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one from uh, Palin Vulcan's talk. Um, so Brian Campos Salazar asks, uh, I was wondering how sexual experience can modify the effects observed in fruitless mutants or even wild type flies at the level of chromatin changes. Sexual experience or social experience? I guess they're asking sexual, sexual experience. So yeah. sexual experience actually has tremendous effects. Um, so for, you know, there are a number of ways that sexual experience can affect the behavior. For example, if we think about, um, you know, we can talk, we can think about from both male's perspective and the female's perspective. So uh, one of the things that happens during courtship between a male and a female is that um, the male basically transfers some of um, some of its pheromones onto the female, which are repulsive to other males. So once the female mates with a male, it becomes unattractive to other males because of that male pheromone. Um, so that's one way that you can modulate it. The other way is like modulating the female receptivity. So after mating um, with the seminal fluid, there are some peptides that are transferred into the females, which activate neurons that go back all the way to those decision circuits that I was talking about and dim those down and quiet those down so that the females actually become less receptive to courtship attempts from other males. So there are a lot, there, there are, um, you know, but these are all actively being researched. So these are the two examples that are the most drastic that I can tell you about. Um, yeah. Hey, Lynn, if, you, if may I um, insert here? So, um, you know, I've often thought in autism about, you know, the effects of, you know, very, the symptoms start to emerge during infancy. And so the child is really not engaging right in the social mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, and we actually have studied quite a bit on how that affects you know, some aspects of brain development, which we can measure with the EEG, but the question of how that um, might affect, you know, some of the underlying circuitry or gene expression or some of the, the mechanisms that you're um, studying. I, I did notice that you said isolation did not, you know, have as big effect as maybe you thought it would, but I, but I don't think this is really isolation, right? It's really a different quality well, of social engagement. Yeah, I wonder your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, isolation does have um, effects. I mean, one of the things that it does is like it actually quiets down the neurons a little bit. So if you quiet down one neuron in a circuit, you know, it's likely going to kind of progress through the rest of the circuit. So you can get more and more depression in the rest of the circuit. Um, um, you know, so, uh, but then there are some, uh, you know, there are some behaviors that get much more accentuated with social isolation. And one of the things that we see is aggression that gets, you know, if you're, if the males are socially isolated, you know, they show a, a much more increased aggression and, um, you know, and, and it affects, you know, like both the peripheral and the central circuits, like we know in terms of gene regulation. So we, we're trying to basically correlate um, the effects of these social isolation and the levels of the chromatin changes to the behaviors that we're seeing. So we're doing some causal experiments now trying to modulate chromatin and see if we can recover some of the, you know, the behavioral aspects. Um, but it's interesting because, I mean, with, with social experience, I mean, if you're already kind of prone to isolating yourself, like in the case of autism disorders, like the more you isolate, it almost like creates this whirlpool, I feel like that you start going more and more into isolation until you shut down in the most drastic cases, I would think. Um, and I, I, I mean, I would just like from my perspective from the fly brain, I can't really say anything about the human brain, but it seems like if you're really turning down the dial on how active these neurons are, you know, with, with social experience, the more you isolate yourself, that's gonna keep affecting the circuit and it's gonna progress from the, you know, periphery to the central to modulate behaviors. 
On a more optimistic note, though, Palin, what struck me about the Drosophila, you know, we're speaking of fly brains, but what struck me about your work is we do talk about epigenetic marks and long-term inheritance of experience, but mm -hmm. I certainly like seeing at least at one part of your talk that it was reversible in five days. So Absolutely. starting to think about what aspects of chromatin remodeling are highly plastic and which aren't would be very helpful. Yep. Um, yeah, that's something that I'm actually super interested in, especially with respect to critical periods, right? So there's there are these critical periods where you have to have a certain window of development and, um, and you need some experience at the same time for the behavior to lock into place. And if you don't get both of them at the same time, there are these defects that persist through the life, you know, through the, um, life of the organism. So one of the things that we do see is that there, there's definitely hormone inputs and there are critical period like, you know, events that are happening in the fly olfactory system where the hormone signals and these social signals actually converge and coincide at the promoters of this fruitless gene. Um, and you need both of them to be there for the fruitless to turn on in the first three days of life as the as the animal is maturing these behaviors. So um, so those kinds of effects maybe are less prone to being uh, reversible because they are more, you know, um, I don't know, consolidated and we don't really know the mechanism, but maybe the other types of influence of social ex sensory experience are more reversible types of chromatin based changes. So that's actually a fascinating question that I'm very interested in to distinguish what's what's different between regular learning and regular responses to critical period based learnings that are like all this, you know, persistent um, effects on behavior. But we don't know the answer. <laughs>